Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. I am Monitor Steve. Hopefully Tim hasn't turned the monitor around or played any pranks on me. So you're able to, to see me at this point. But we are back for part two. Don't touch it, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've given Tim all the power here. I don't like this arrangement. I'm not sure what's going on at the other end. Anyway, part two, monthly Q&A. We have, well, another half of the questions to get through. So... Another 20 minutes or so of us answering questions, so I think we should probably jump into that. What do you reckon, Tim? Sounds good. Let's get into it. Alrighty. Okay, question here. Uh, I believe this is another console one. What do you guys personally think of the announced spec for Xbox Series X, X, and PS5? What do you personally think, Tim? Um, I mean, the thing I really... it's in, like It's interesting to see what they're doing all sort of hardware and that sort of thing always just interests me to sort of see what's going on i think that you know there's a lot of people out there that are sort of making this a spec war type thing like xbox versus playstation i don't think that has any bearing on the consoles at all it's mostly determined by sort of games and that sort of thing like what can you actually play on these consoles not how powerful they are i don't think it has much of an influence on that sort of market but people love to make that a big thing so Go ahead and have your war about whichever one's more powerful. But mm -hmm. it certainly is interesting to see specifically on, like, the Xbox side, the hardware that they're able to put into the APU in terms of, you know, your 52 compute units. The PS5 has fewer compute units, but they're clocked quite high, certainly higher than we've mm -hmm. seen from current RDNA parts. So those are the things that interest me more about the hardware, not like, oh, one's 10 teraflops, one's 12 teraflops. I don't care about that. The games will be different on each system, and people will choose largely not based on that sort of stuff. But for the PC side, yeah, the hardware is really interesting. See, seeing those two things, I think, is, yeah, it's really exciting. And yet in the storage stuff that we've already talked about. So how do you sort of see it? Do you find anything interesting here? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, as you know, I'm not terribly interested in consoles. I won't be buying or using either one of them. So their existence, well, they don't really exist in my, my world. And again, I, I have absolutely nothing against consoles. They just don't interest me. So I don't really want to play on them. I... I guess that's as far as that one goes. But what it means for PC gaming, I'm interested in. So I'm interested to see what the future of gaming looks like, how well future games sort of leverage this hardware, use higher core count processors and all that sort of stuff, uh, which is obviously the consoles dictate that a bit, but I'm more interested in seeing just how it plays out on the PC front. All right, next one here. Some nice 1080p gaming and video editing recommendations for someone really struggling with money. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I imagine this is not so much a monitor thing. It's more of a CPU, GPU yeah, combo. Yeah, that's how I thought it was going to be, yeah. Uh, well, obviously, a really good option at the moment. Depends on your region. It's kind of awesome they've been brought to Australia. We pushed pretty heavily for this, the uh, Ryzen 5 1600 AF. Also depends on whether you want to buy new or used, what your used market's like, stuff like that. So, uh, But if you're buying new, which is generally what we focus on, uh, the Ryzen 5 1600 AF is a great investment because it gets you on the AM4 platform. And already there's just so many amazing upgrade options there to 8, 12, 16 core processors. So... If you can find yourself a, a cheap B350, B450 motherboard, 1600 AF, and things like, you know, the, the Radeon RX 570 or 580, they're still really good buys, um, probably worth looking at for those. You can actually, in most regions, get those secondhand for, for like very, very low prices. They're pretty hard to beat. So I'd be looking out for that kind of combo. Um, yep. But jump into any of our sort of recent, more affordable GPU reviews there, and you can sort of have a look at what's available, uh, like your sort of 1660 Supers downwards. Um, they're all fairly affordable. Uh, but yeah, if you're really struggling for money, obviously secondhand shopping's often a good way to go. Uh, of course, there are pitfalls there. You can get burnt, and you don't get things like warranty often. But yeah, so just depends what you got available. One of the most popular, if not the most popular, B450 motherboards is the B450 Tomahawk due to its VRM temps and power delivery. So would other motherboards with the same VRM design like the B450 Gaming Plus and B450-A Pro provide similar levels while being 20 to 25 euros cheaper? Yeah, look, they should. 
uh, we were just sort of breaking into our VRM testing around that series, and the channel has grown substantially since. Uh, our Patreon backing has grown a lot, so we're now in a position where we can buy a lot of boards. So the point I'm trying to make is back then, we couldn't afford to buy all the B450 boards. Like, we could afford to buy, like, 10 X570 boards. So I didn't test the B450 Gaming Plus and the B450A Pro simply because we couldn't afford to buy so many boards. We tested the Tomahawk and the Pro Carbon, both excellent boards. The Pro Carbon's even better than the Tomahawk, but it's more expensive. But yeah, it stands to reason that those boards, uh, the more the, the slightly cheaper ones, should deliver similar VRM thermal performance. Heat sinks are slightly changed, so it depends there, but they're on the on both those boards they seem like they would work well enough. So if you don't, I, I don't think there's too much difference in terms of other features, uh, such as USB support and all that kind of stuff. You'd have to look into that yourself. But yeah, to answer your question, VRM temperatures should be similar. However, we haven't tested them. Uh, here's one for Tim, Mr. News Corner. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read this one out for you, Tim. All right. Expect, uh, have you got that crystal ball yet? You were talking about getting that I don't last know. It, it hasn't arrived yet. It's, it's disappointing. Uh, it's not here. Yeah. But we'll give It'll it a be, go anyway. Yeah, okay. Uh, any predictions on upcoming GPUs from NVIDIA and AMD? <laughs> no. <laughs> Basically is the answer to that. Um, how many people upvoted that? Who are you? How many people are you letting down in our audience? Probably a fair few. Usually, these prediction crystal ball questions get a lot of upvotes. I mean, when not... I predict it will be uh, probably um, the most interesting sort of battle com- generation we've had in a long time. Yeah, that's what I predict. I think that's uh, uh, yeah, it's fair. So again, who knows? It could it could be the worst, but I think that's where we're heading. So fingers yeah, I mean, crossed we are. It's just so hard to predict the actual hardware and stuff because we're not even uh, in the credible rumor stage. Like maybe nah, in the credible rumor nah. stage and you start hearing about compute unit counts and that sort of thing, then maybe you can yep. make some predictions. But right now it's like we know RDNA 2 is coming. We know the next gen NVIDIA. GPU is coming on a new process node. They're going to be faster. They're probably going to be cheaper, especially with what AMD is doing on the consoles. But outside of that, it's just impossible to say. But I think, mm-hmm. as you say, it should be a really good GPU generation. I expect that this will be a time that a lot of people will want to upgrade. Yeah, hopefully we see AMD competing at more price points, especially the uh, higher up ones. All right, next question. A never-ending question is the next question, but was hoping for a 2020 update. How much watts, so from a power supply, do more recent PCs need? Why is it important to go a bit over for the PSU uh, than the watts used by the PC. Okay, so yeah, not much has really changed on that front. Basically, if you look at like CPU or GPU reviews, uh, like our, our CPU and GPU reviews, for example, we will show total system usage. And generally, like for GPUs, we test with a Core i5, 9900K of clock to 5 gigahertz, quite a, quite a heavy uh, power user there. And generally with sort of mid-range to higher in graphics cards, you're looking at like 300 watts of power usage during gaming. So for most systems, like your 500 watt to 600 watt power supply is going to be sufficient. Um, Seven, 800 watts is sort of pushing up there to the higher end and beyond that, it's like extreme high-end desktop type stuff. So not much has changed there really. Uh, Yeah, look around your, your 650 watt probably for most builds. And then why is it important to go a bit over what the PSU, you know, well, what the PC is using for the PSU? Basically, power supplies have an efficiency, maximum efficiency, and that's not at 100% usage. Uh, so it'll be up probably around 80%. So you want to sort of give that 20% headroom. You also don't want to be stressing the hell out of your power supply when you're encoding a video or playing a game or whatever for extended periods of time. So you want it to be sort of doing it a bit easier than it would be otherwise. So that's, I think that's why a lot of people sort of opt for your 750, 850 when they probably really only need like 500 just to have that extra headroom. You can go the other way on efficiency, but generally with like it being a $10 difference to go from like a 650 to a 750 or whatever, people usually just pay the $10. So it's a bit more future-proofed and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, But I suppose, you know, we don't review power supplies. We're not power supply experts. So we're only going to give you fairly basic answers on this stuff yeah i also like looking into sort of a lot of 
power supplies now have fanless modes. So it's always good. Usually the higher wattage power supplies allow more wattage during the fanless mode. So I always like to see that could be a reason to buy a higher wattage power supply as well if you're really into that sort of silent PC type thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of another thing that I like to look into. But as you say, yeah, it's, it's good to be in that sweet spot in the middle of the efficiency curve. Yeah, I don't think going super overkill hurts the efficiency at the lower wattages too much. Yeah. Uh, I think that's probably offset by some of the things you just mentioned. Also, generally, they have higher quality components that last longer. Yeah, they're like so 80 plus that, platinum and stuff. Yeah, so spending that little bit of extra money, depending on you know, how much extra it is, can often be worth it. But if we're talking $10, $20, it's probably worth it in the long run. Uh, is it worthwhile waiting for next-gen console launches for building a new gaming system to get the massive leaps in desktop graphics? I feel like we've... Possibly answered this question three times now. <laughs> There's been a lot of discussion on consoles and waiting for stuff at the moment. Yeah. I mean, with this question, it's kind of like just because the consoles are launching at the end of this year doesn't mean we're getting new graphics cards around that time. It's we have uh -huh. the console manufacturers have already said they're targeting holiday 2020. We have no idea on the GPU side. So it's possible they are out, it's possible they aren't out. But like with all these waiting questions, it really depends on sort of... We were talking about this recently in the live stream earlier today because oh, a few people asked remember. us <laughs> about sort of buying now or waiting for the next generation once we get this this console bump if we if yep. we end up getting that. It's like, well, you're probably still facing 6 to 12 months at least of waiting. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a situation of, you know, what are you using now compared to what are you going to be upgrading to? If it's a big upgrade, then it's kind of like you're getting six to 12 months of a big upgrade now versus, you know, having your poor, you know, performing system and then getting an even bigger upgrade in the future. Or if you kind of upgrade more frequently to smaller jumps, then it might not be worth upgrading now. It might be better to wait. So with all these sort of should I buy now, should I wait sort of situations, I think you'd say it's fair. The only time we recommend people to wait is when the next generation is imminent, like it's yeah. just about to come out, in which case either if you buy the new stuff, then you get more performance, or the old stuff tends to get a lot cheaper. So yeah. because we're not really in that position now, it's still it's still a point where assess as normal as to sort of the upgrades that you might be doing, and yeah, that, that stuff can be potentially your next upgrade. Um, yeah, if you've been... Again, it's something you have to evaluate on a personal level. Everyone's going to be different, but if you've been dying for a new PC upgrade, you desperately need one to enjoy the new games then I would suggest probably going ahead and doing that. Again, you, you have to evaluate for yourself. There's also the human malware situation that can be in affecting prices. So you, again, that's something else to consider. And I think I must've said this on the live stream. We don't know what's happening as six, 12 months down the track. Like we could get a vaccine for the human malware <laughs> and then, I don't know, cryptocurrency mining makes a you know starts booming and then we have the problem we had a few years ago so yeah it's a gamble basically so yeah you'll just have to work out whether you can wait or not and what yep. makes sense for you all right steve is the radeon 7 still relevant trick question was it ever relevant <laughs> uh so for productivity type stuff yeah, there's some really good arguments for why the Radeon 7 was an amazing buy, and it certainly was, uh, with what it offers for productivity type stuff, whether it's heavy compute, big VRAM, all that kind of stuff. For gaming, I don't know how relevant it ever was. I can't wait to eat those words five years down the track when it's probably murdering the RTX 2080 for with all that extra VRAM. But, but seriously, at uh, the time of release, it only came in the... Well, the reference card, which is generally fairly loud, you can undervolt it and do all that stuff and get it to a more reasonable operating volume. But come on, RTX 2080s, there's some really great custom cards that were selling for similar prices, cooler, quieter, much better in games, and to this day are still better in games. So yeah, it wasn't a terrible buy, but there were certainly better options at the time, such as the RTX 2080. What would you recommend for a monitor for people with bottomless money? <laughs> so all those lucky people out there, they've just got stacks of cash to pull on. But they've got nothing to do. They're just sitting in their houses on top of their uh, bottomless <laughs> money pits. Yeah, that's right. Um, there's kind of a couple of ways I'd go here. If you, I'm assuming you'd have a pretty powerful PC if you had bottomless money. I'm talking like 2080 Ti stuff. 
think which, that's safe to assume. In which case, then I'd probably recommend your sort of high-end 4K 144Hz HDR monitors like the Acer Predator uh, X27, I believe it's called, is the better of the options there. Um, mm-hmm. It's a really good quality monitor. I believe you use one of those for one of your like yeah, test setups just because you happen to have one. Um, very high quality, good quality HDR. And I think there's a newer version of that available now or coming soon as well that has even more uh, backlighting zones to improve the HDR. Okay. So it might be worth going down that path uh, if that's available at the at this moment. I'm 100% sure on that. Then for the ultra wides, I reviewed the LG 38GL 950G recently. That's another HDR, well, not quite proper HDR, but high resolution, high refresh rate, good response times. Um, that's where I'd go for ultra wides. It's also very expensive. It's like thou- we're talking thousands of dollars for these monitors. So <laughs> those are the sort of things I'd be looking at. And then you have your OLED TVs as well. I think there's 40 new 48 inch OLED TVs that might be worth looking at. And my fourth option would sort of be maybe you don't want to, maybe you still want your ultra graphic settings and you don't want to be running at 4K for low frame rates. Even if you have a 20 Ti, you're probably looking at you know, 60 to 80 FPS in modern games at ultra settings. So maybe you want to go 1440p instead, which is perfectly fine for, for higher refresh rates. And then I've recommended the, the 27 GL850 a lot there. I still think that's a good buy. So that's obviously much cheaper. It's like 500 bucks compared to one and a half thousand. So. <laughs> bit, maybe th- that isn't for people with bottomless money, but just everyday people. <laughs> All right, Tim, another news corner question for you. You ready? Yep. Good, good, good. Any news on 4000 series APUs for desktop applications? Yeah, I thought these would have been out by now. Uh, I I thought they'd sort of launch with the, the mobile parts, but yeah, no real news mm. on them at the moment. doesn't seem like there's even rumors at this stage, like we haven't heard leaks or anything of people testing these desktop parts yet. So I'm assuming well, they're coming, but they're just, yeah, who knows? Yeah, I, I imagine they would come after Zen 3, wouldn't they, though? Just like the 3000 series APUs did. Yeah, those launched at the same time, didn't they? We got the, like the 3400G. Yeah, they, they were announced, yeah. Yeah, in the... so maybe that's what they're going to do this this generation. It's, it's I, hard I to would, say. Yeah, I, w- I would expect that we would hear about it around the same time as Zen 3. In your TN versus IPS versus VA comparison video from a while back, VA monitors were shown to be consistently slower than their TN and IPS counterparts, e.g. often falling to be under you know, 6 to 7 millisecond mark for 144 Hz. Uh, do you think that getting a high refresh rate VA monitor is pointless then if the panel cannot keep up with the refresh rate window it's rated for? Um, it's a good question. I think th- there are some monitors where that's true, that they're too slow for sort of the high refresh rates and the difference between running at 144 and 120 hertz visually is, is very similar. But then there's other monitors. I'm Actually, Steve is on the, the 32GK650F here. Uh, this is quite a good VA monitor in that its response times are fast enough for 144 hertz. So part of that question, the answer to that question is it depends on the monitor. Some are actually good enough. The other thing with, with VA is it's kind of... It's a budget to mid-range type technology. IPS is for your high-end stuff. It's getting into the mid-range a little bit these days, but mostly it's still your expensive premium monitors that use that technology, whereas VA is more competing with your TNs. So TN obviously has a lot of downsides with colors, like viewing angles, contrast ratios, and that sort of thing, and color reproduction, whereas VAs are slower, but they have much better viewing angles and colors and that sort of thing. So I think there's definitely still a reason if you're interested in still a decent gaming experience, but you really want the color performance, then a VA is a, is a good way to go because they're often quite cheap, quite affordable. So there's definitely a place for them in the market. They're not, as I said, not a high-end technology, not the best balance, but I still think there's reason to buy them in, in some circumstances. All right, next question. Why aren't the many air-cooled components in a PC designed to complement each other in regards to airflow? Uh, for example, a stock CPU cooler vents air in every which way. Uh, sort of, I suppose you're talking about you know, the circular thin arrays for your AMD box coolers and even the Intel ones, I suppose. Uh, the GPU probably vents air towards the side and front panels uh, also. So basically saying, uh, does this not result in turbulent airflow? So is everything sort of fighting each other or just the airflow is not as efficient as it could be? Uh, yeah, I suppose in some ways, but generally the air that the case fans are pushing through the case, things like a downwards facing circular CPU heatsink doesn't really impact that airflow. It's still 
going to get sucked out of the case. It's not aiding it, but I don't think it's really inhibiting it too much. I think the idea of, well, there's a couple of reasons why they have the downward facing sort of circular thin array heat sinks. And the main reason is compatibility. Uh, they don't obstruct memory or any of the other components. And they also help with, uh, say, VRM cooling on the motherboard. So no matter where the VRM heat sinks are situated, it should be pushing air over them. Um, memory modules can obstruct that and things like that. But basically, it doesn't matter how the system's configured, you will still get sufficient airflow in those areas. The graphics cards, yeah, look, they go all over the place. But again, the case should be able to, the case fan should be able to direct that air eventually out of the case. So obviously tower style coolers, they're designed to push towards the exhaust fans. Uh, but yeah, stock cooling doesn't necessarily do that for some of the compatibility reasons that I spoke of. Uh, but overall, I don't think it impacts things too much. We don't do a whole lot of testing that kind of stuff. That's more probably gamers Nexus do a bit of that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah. Obviously, if you want better CPU cooling and better airflow, you'd upgrade to a tower-style cooler. Can impact a VRM cooling depending on the quality of your board and things like that. All right, this one should be pretty easy for us to answer. Which Australian retailers for computer parts do you recommend and which do you find the most dodgy? Well, I don't know if we'll touch on the dodgy part because I think most Australian retailers are pretty good. Yep. There's possibly one or two less reputable uh, retailers out there, but... I won't go naming names because we don't have any sort of hard evidence or whatever. We don't. Yeah, most retailers I buy from have been good. So. Yep. Yeah, like uh, obviously we really like working with PC Case Gear. Uh, we sort of singled them out, went after them because we liked their service. We liked working with them, and we were confident they would look after our viewers well. Um, and a lot of our Patreon members shop with them and are very happy with them. So we do like to recommend PC case gear, but some of their competitors are also very good as well. Like I've, I've had multiple successful purchases through companies such as Scorp Tech, uh, PLE, uh, even Umart. We, they're not huge in Victoria, are they? Umart? No, I don't I think have so. Ordered some, I've ordered some stuff, I think, from maybe the New South Wales. I'm not sure how it works with them, but I have ordered stuff from them in the past and they've been good. Uh, but yeah, generally we recommend PC case gear because, you know, we work closely with them and... They've been reliable for us. Yeah, that, that's, that was the company I used before even doing this. I always bought my stuff through them and they've been yep. good. But yeah, as you say, a lot of the other uh, companies like even M-Wave, I, I bought a few monitors through there because mm. they have a pretty good stock yep. of stuff and yeah, it's all been all been pretty good. All right, last question here. We've made it. I've got the uh, sniffles today, guys. <laughs> no no uh, human malware. I've just uh, I kicked up a lot of dust and dirt working on an excavator on the weekend and i inhaled a lot of it and it's, it's been likely story causing me i don't have human malware <laughs> at, least that I, at least that i know of just allergies at the moment anyway we'll probably get this last question out of the way before i get into that story um is there any visual difference in running games at 1080p on a 4k monitor or on a 1080p monitor. So, yeah, did I read that correctly? Yep. Um, any of it? Yep. So, okay. Uh, will 4K resolution be a perfect upscale for 1080p content? So, four times scaling. Uh, so, generally speaking, the answer to this is no. A 1080p mm -hmm. on a 10... Like, assuming we're talking the same screen size here, the mm -hmm. 1080p on a 1080p monitor will look better than the 1080p on a 4K monitor because... Not a lot of monitors and not a lot of GPUs implement the perfect integer scaling by default. A lot of monitor, well, it depends on sort of whether you check the monitor or GPU scaling checkbox in your GPU settings as to which component does the scaling. But a lot of them, a lot of them do various different tricks to try and improve imp try and improve the image quality, which helps more with sort of not perfect scaling settings. So, for example, fourteen forty p up to four k or whatever, or ten eighty p to 1440 or whatever, they'll tend to do a bunch of tricks that aren't necessarily disabled when you want that perfect scaling. But luckily these days, uh, I think all three GPU vendors, including Intel, have integer scaling options in the GPU settings. So you mm -hmm. should be able to do that perfect pixel scaling on your 4K monitor these days in games. So that means that you can get that you know perfect scaling solution and they should look the same. But if you're not using that setting, then generally speaking, you'll get a softer image uh, with the 1080 to 4K upscale. At least that's what I've mm -hmm. experienced. 
Yeah, I suppose this is a question for someone who has a 4K editing rig, but not a super powerful GPU and they want to play games at maybe, well, not at highest frame rates really. I mean, you can still do that without V-Sync on, but anyway, it's yep. it's not something that a lot of people are going to encounter is, is basically what I'm getting at. Yep. Okay, here we are at the end of the community tab, the YouTube questions. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this month's series, a little different to how we are normally do it. But yeah, crazy times at the moment. So, you know, we've got to do what we've got to do and we've made the Q&A happen, I think. So hopefully, glad hopefully we're it's happening. Well, <laughs> it's all on you, Tim. Don't mess this up. Yep. Uh, no, I, I think we've been able to pull this off uh, at, a, at a reasonable quality level. But anyway, it is what it is. Nothing we can do about it. Nothing you guys can do about it. We're just going to do our best to get through it. But hopefully this has entertained all of our viewers and we will have a part three Patreon edition coming up. There's always some some cracking questions from our Patreon members. They yeah, always ask some doozies, so that should be a bit of fun. But anyway, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, do all that stuff. Normally, our setup, as I said, is not like this, so this isn't usual content for us. Uh, we've also got Patreon stuff, but we've done most of the, the live streams and like for this month. Uh, what else, Tim? What else have we got? Merch, all that yeah, sort of stuff. Merch. Hit the like button. I think you already said that, though. That's always yeah, important. Yeah, all the usual stuff. Yep. So I guess all there is left to say is that I'm your host, Steve. And I'm your host, Tim. And we'll... Yeah, how's this going to work? All good? <laughs> all good. 